Okay, now that we're all on the same page about uh, what we mean when we talk about machine learning, let's take a closer look at several subtypes of machine learning. So that's provided in this overview figure over here. So roughly speaking, we make a breakdown of machine learning methods into uh, supervised learning methods, of which we already saw examples in the form of regression and classification. We have unsupervised learning methods. We already saw an example in the form of clustering. And then we have reinforcement learning methods, of which I will later on show an example. Now at this point, I want to, on a high level, make clear the distinction between these three classes of machine learning methods. All methods are based, uh, well, they, they adhere to this definition of machine learning in the sense that they have some tasks to perform and they can improve doing this task based on experience. And in a supervised, supervised learning setting, my experience or my data always comes in the form of input, a set of inputs and corresponding targets. So in supervised learning methods, I always have input output pairs, input target pairs. Now, what's characteristic of unsupervised learning methods is that actually I only have these inputs. I have a lot of data and I have an algorithm that does something with the data and becomes better at it, but it isn't focusing on predicting or classifying uh, some corresponding labels that come with the data. So in this case, we only have the data, but not necessarily corresponding labels. Uh, we saw an example of that uh, based on clustering. Reinforcement learning methods is a kind of unique class of machine learning uh, methods in the sense that if you look at supervised and unsupervised learning methods, the, the data is provided upfront, like, um, hello algorithm, here is a lot of experience that I've gathered for you, now do your job and improve yourself. So that's sort of uh, the, the, the supervised and unsupervised learning approach. In reinforcement learning methods, experience is, is gained along the way. So uh, let's write it down. Experience or uh, data is gathered along the way. So it's a sort of loose definition, but later on I'll show an example uh, of, of what I actually mean with this. Okay, so uh, we, make, we made a breakdown into three categories. Now, Let's have a closer look into these three different types, starting off with supervised learning. Again, supervised learning methods always come, uh, the data always comes in pairs of input and a corresponding target. In the case of the MNIST uh, digit classification case, we have an input image and a corresponding digit. So in this case, this represents a two, so the target is this uh, digit class two. In a regression case, we also have input target pairs. So we have an input a value on the x-axis and we want to predict a corresponding value on this t, this target axis, whatever this signal represents. So we have an input and a corresponding output and we have a set of points, these blue points over here that represent the data. Now, what distinguishes uh, these two methods from one another is the way they deal with targets and the way, uh, the kind of problems that they solve. In classification problems, um, we always are interested in turning an input into a corresponding label. And this target, so this target can only take on values in, uh, can only take on values of this predefined subset of classes. In the digit classification case, it could only be a zero, a one, and so forth, up to a nine. So we could only choose out of 10 classes. So that's characteristic of uh, classification that the output target is a discrete label. What's character characteristic of regression is that these targets can basically take on any value, any numerical value uh, within some interval. In uh, the regression case, we were interested in predicting some real number which represents this vertical axis. So that's characteristic of regression methods that we're predicting continuous outputs. Right, so in the regression case, I could predict for, for this point, well, uh, so something over here like a 1.1 um, and anything close to it. But in uh, the classification data set, it doesn't make sense to make a prediction of the digit, like saying, okay, this is the digit 2.5 because it isn't a digit. So it isn't in the class of uh, labels that I consider. 
Okay, so now what's common in these supervised learning methods is that the objective is always to find some function that maps the input to the corresponding target as close as possible. And we want to, this function to do that for all known data sets, so for our, our, all known data, for our training data, but also for unknown data. And this, I would like to stress this, this reference to unknown data being able to perform well on unknown data refers to generalization. And this is important because, uh, of course, we want our, our algorithm to do well on the training data, but also when we deploy it, we, we will encounter data which we haven't seen before and we want it to perform also well on this data. And the example that I gave before, with, which related to overfitting was that, okay, I could fit a function that does very well on my training data, on my known data, but whenever I encounter a new point, for example, over here, um, which is probably then lying somewhere over there, there's a huge difference between what I predict and what is actually there. So we want to avoid these mistakes. We want to avoid overfitting. In other words, we want to generalize to unknown situations. Okay, now let's move on to unsupervised learning methods. All right, so in the unsupervised learning methods, I have a, a data, but I do not have corresponding labels. Uh, still, we can devise algorithms that, uh, that that solve useful tasks. And one of such tasks is compression, All right? So in this example, I'm going to consider compression. Now, why do I want to do this? Uh, imagine you're, you're running a, a website with thousands of user, users and each user has a, a thumbnail image, an avatar image, and you have to save this on your server, but you're cheap, you want to spend little money on this, um, you're Dutch, <laughs> in other words. <laughs> uh, so you only afford a server that uh, that can save up a couple of megabytes of, of disk space. So and so you cannot afford to save all all of these images, which in this example will be of size 100 by 100. And so you want to reduce the amount of data you, you're going to store. So that's the, that's the goal. So uh, to save on disk space, for example. Now. Now there are uh, several ways of doing compression. In this example, I'll take a closer look at uh, principal component analysis. Um, I won't go into too much specific details, but just want to stick to a high level and the idea of compression in itself. BCA will be covered in chapter 12 and in one of the, the later uh, videos uh, of this course. Now what BCA, roughly speaking, does, it looks at all the data available and first of all, it looks for a common structure in the data, right? So we have all these images, each has a pair of eyes, a nose and a mouth. And uh, well, we can visualize this commonality by just taking the average of all these images. We average, average these image, images and we get this mean image over here. Okay, so this is a sort of generic face, very smooth, smooth uh, skin. Um, it's a face but it's, it's also generic. So I cannot assign this face to each of my users in the database. Um, so what principal component analysis also does, it looks for differences between these images. It looks for uh, components, principal components, uh, the, which are visualized over here. So sort of, which are also called eigenfaces in the computer vision uh, community, which explain the differences between these images. For example, some look a bit more grumpy uh, not really smiling a lot, some are smiling a lot. And um, so these are variations in the data. And these principal components capture these variations in the data. And let me explain it with an example below. Um, suppose I want to represent this image now in terms of these principal components. I can do that. So I consider this, these principal components as a basis for representing images. So my starting point would, would be to take the average image value, like this mean image, and then I add an amount of the first principal component, that's MS1. So I find a coefficient alpha i, which I assign to this thing, and so I add this component to my mean. And this is the best I can do that comes close to the original image. So I change the skin color a bit, but still it doesn't look so much like me. Um, but if I then add more details, so apparently my face is different enough from this uh, generic uh, average face, so I need to add more variations to it. 
Um, so I take more and more of these components. Let's say I take 10 of these components and I see that I can already recover my face more accurately by uh, adding a bit more of, of different components. Uh, right? So I start recognizing my eyes, uh, there's a bit, little bit of beard added. So maybe there's a principal component that accounts for variations in beard or, or fair skin. Um, okay, and, and then we continue. So let's just pick 50 of these uh, principal component because if I look at the second, the MS10 case, uh, there's no smile, there, there needs to be a smile. So uh, I'm looking for my principal components. For example, this one has very dominant teeth in it. So probably in order to achieve an image like this, I need to be add more of this principal component to it. So the, the coefficient that corresponds to the principal component should be high. Well, and then you see if I consider 50 of these principal components, I'm actually starting to do a pretty accurate job in representing the original image. Still, it's a bit noisy. So just to be sure, I go up to 150 of these components. And what I managed to do is recover the image quite well with only 150 of these, um, of these alpha values. Okay, so what does this tell us? Instead of saving 100 by 100 uh, pixels, so 10,000 of these, these values, I can also just save, um, so I can only just save MS150 alpha coefficients. And this saves me a lot of memory. Now, a separate class of, uh, of unsupervised learning methods uh, is clustering. So we already encountered that uh, in the context of tumor analysis, where the goal was, okay, we want to identify clusters of, of tumor samples that are similar. Uh, we could use this information, for example, to, to adjust our treatment plan, because maybe we know that for some tumors, a particular treatment work well. So we want to use the same treatment for, well, uh, a, a tumor which is uh, similar. Now, such clustering methods, they're mostly based around the ID that points in my data are similar, and we want to cluster them into these classes. Now, I already went over an example in the, the previous uh, video, so I won't go into too much detail here. But the point is, with clustering, you can recover structure in the data. Now, there's other types of learning methods, uh, something in between supervised and unsupervised learning method, and this is called well, semi-supervised learning. And the idea here is that, again, I have data. So I have data samples x1 up to xn. But now I do not have available the full set of targets. I only have targets available for t1 up to tk, for example, where k is smaller than n. So what this means is I have data. Some of it is labeled and some of, some of it it isn't. Uh, so and and the goal is to really exploit all available data. Now now let's consider, for example, let's consider the example of a classification algorithm that looks for images. In in images, it looks for cats and dogs. And so I have a lot of examples. This is an image of a cat, and this is an image of a dog. I also have a lot of images for which I don't have this information. But the idea of unsupervised learning method is to recover the structure of data and recover. Um, well, similarities in data. So if I now have a, an image which is very similar to an image of a cat, so it has all the same colors, all the same texture in the image, then I can use this information to assign also the proper label to this image, which probably is, is a, a, an image of a cat. Okay, so that's the idea of, of semi-supervised learning method is try to use all uh, available data that you have. Finally, there's this unique class of machine learning methods uh, called reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, um, what I mentioned before, experience is, is gained along the way. So it's still a learning method. It does some task and it becomes better with more and more experience. But instead of providing all the experience or all the data upfront, gaining experience is part of the algorithm. And this is, for example, also how this famous uh, AlphaGo system was trained. Uh, so it was a computer that learned to play the game of Go, and it did a pretty good job at it. And basically it was trained in a simulated environment. Uh, the idea is if I want to learn this game, uh, I could read the rule book, but 
it doesn't make a good play, you need experience. So in such reinforcement learning systems, we always have to deal with the state of the game, of the, 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 well, the state of the environment. So we have all these, these uh, white and black uh, marbles on the board. Uh, so that's the current state. And now you or the computer as an agent is able to take actions. It can put another piece on the board. And so it, it changes its environment. And this induces a change in the state, but it also leads to a reward or a penalty, right? Because by making this action, I, I either gain some ground on the board or I lose some. I gain some points or I lose some points. And this is then experience, which I can use later on. If it was a good move, then I should remember it. Maybe I should try this again uh, next time. If it was a bad mood, uh, move, then you remember not to do it uh, again. So such learning methods are typically uh, based on the concept of, of trial and error. Now, applications are mainly in, in the context of, of games. Uh, this, this ranges from, from chess to, to StarCraft or other strategic uh, uh, games. And the reason for this is that they uh, operate in a virtual environment. And this is really convenient for reinforcement learning methods because if you make mistakes in a virtual environment, well, first of all, you can simulate what this uh, action leads to, uh, but also you're not harming your environment. You're only harming a virtual environment in case you make a mistake. Whereas in the practical world, you cannot always afford to make mistakes uh, or not too often or not too severe mistakes. So it's quite a challenge to move this to the practical world, but uh, there are some examples of reinforcement learning uh, being used, for example, uh, in the context of uh, robotics. Okay, that, that's all I have to say for the moment about machine learning. Just want to mention that we have a second year's master course on this topic. So if you're interested, uh, take a look at that. All right, so let me conclude with this again with this definition of machine learning. Uh, recall that a machine learning algorithm is designed to perform some task and it becomes better uh, with more and more experience. And uh, we just went over three of these examples of three classes, supervised learning methods, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Um, well, if you take a closer look at it, uh, maybe you paid attention to it throughout the talk. All of these classes are indeed types of machine learning. <laughs>